Good morning, and welcome back to the 10th Annual Sacred Trust Talks and Book Signings event presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. The Gettysburg Foundation is the nonprofit partner to the National Park Service here at Gettysburg. And over the years, as we've presented Sacred Trust, we've had the great honor of presenting renowned authors, historians, um, National Park Service rangers, and licensed battlefield guides so that they can share their unique perspectives on the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War with you, our visitors. And this year is, is absolutely no exception. Coming up next, Stephen Fox will present The Confederacy at Sea, Raphael Semmes and the CSS Alabama. The redoubtable Captain Raphael Semmes and his Alabama roamed the seas for 22 months, capturing 65 Union merchant vessels and destroying, in today's money, $700 million worth of ships and cargo. Fox will draw from his book, Wolf of the Deep, to tell this amazing story. Stephen Fox, author of a myriad of books, articles, and papers, has a degree in American Civilization from Brown University and has served as board member and then chair of the board of Penn, New England. He has appeared on radio and television, giving on-camera testimony in the eight-part A&E series based on his book, Blood and Power, Five of his books are cited in the brief bibliographies for the relevant entries in the Oxford Companion to United States History. Many of these books have been published internationally. I'd like for you all to join me in welcoming Stephen Fox. Thank you, Brooke. Hello, everybody. Good morning. On this day, 150 years ago, July 6th, 1864, about 3,500 miles northeast of here, Captain Raphael Semmes, who was the first and the greatest Confederate naval hero, was recuperating in London from the loss of his ship, the Alabama, which had just been sunk in a showdown with a Union gunboat off Cherbourg, France. He was hurting physically and emotionally, mourning his dead and wounded but he could still take some satisfaction from what he had achieved in the last two years. Here's a typical comment by the Manchester Guardian, that great newspaper in Britain. He paralyzed the commerce of a great nation. The career of the Alabama was so wonderful and romantic. The effect of her crusade against the enemies of her, of her flag was so extraordinary. That particular aspect of Sam's and his ship has often been slighted. The impacts of the cruise on northern commerce and morale, on Anglo-American relations during the war and for long afterward, and on the long-term prospects of the American merchant marine. This one little ship on the vast ocean affected all of these things in major ways. At a time when the war was being fought only in the south, Semmes brought it home to the north in unavoidable ways. The war now affected not just Union soldiers and sailors and their families in the North, but bystanding civilians, merchants, people in maritime businesses, and indeed the proceedings in Washington. Here's a map of the cruise. You can see it up there. Uh, I can't use my pointer on this particular one, but it starts in England, in Liverpool. So go to the top of the map there in the middle. The ship is made in Liverpool and it's snuck out of Liverpool under mysterious circumstances on July 29th, 1862, and then goes down to the Azores off Portugal for a rendezvous with two other British ships, which bring it men, supplies, guns, and ammunition, and it then goes hunting with a British crew and mainly Confederate officers. The first prize, a whaler from Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, was taken on September 5th, over the next two weeks, they take nine more prizes, mainly whalers that are there in the Azores at that season, and Sems knows this. And so it's good hunting, ten prizes in two weeks. The remarkable thing is that nobody is killed or wounded in any of these encounters. The scenario is this. They approach a Union merchant ship. They're faster than any whaler or merchant ship. Under a disguise, typically, usually a, a British flag, a, a traditional technique in naval warfare, the crew and any passengers aboard the captured ship are brought aboard the Alabama. The Union ship is searched for anything useful and then torched. The captives are then put ashore or transferred to a passing vessel. Nobody's hurt 
It's very gentlemanly. This is very much unlike the submarine warfare of the 20th century. The first five months of the cruise established the historical reputations for Sam, Sam's and his ship. They go off to the Grand Banks. You can follow the map here off the northeast coast of North America. That's the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. They go there. There's lots of good hunting. Then Sam's decides to invade New York City. The man had chutzpah. It's one moderately sized ship, and he's going to invade the busiest harbor in North America, if you please. And the plan might have worked. The plan was to go in there on a dark night, no starlight, no moonlight, and sink some ships and transfer the, the people on them to the light ships in the harbor, lob a few shells into lower Manhattan, this is all under cover of darkness, and then run out to sea before there was any sort of pursuit still at night. And it might have worked, but the problem was they were running out of coal. This is now two months, this is October of 62. They're two months into the cruise. They have not replenished their coal supply, and Sims knows that uh, he needs his coal to run for days on end, probably. So they decide not to do it. Everybody is very let down. The crew was dying to pull this off, to attack New York City, but they decided not to. So instead, they, they go down to off the... Um, tip of Cuba, the eastern tip of Cuba, you can see there, where they uh, catch a major passenger steamer, the Ariel, with 500 passengers. Well, what are they going to do with 500 passengers? They don't have room for 500 passengers, so they have to let her go on bond to be paid after the war if the South wins. And then they disappear. Nobody knows where they are. He sneaks into the Gulf of Mexico, goes up to Galveston, Texas, and sinks a Union gunboat and two people are killed on the Union ship. Those are the first deaths of the crews. And then he goes on to the northeast coast of Brazil. You can see it there. You see all the list of the captures there. Uh, it's a very active shipping lane area, the northeast coast of Brazil. It's really good hunting. And then he decides to go to the Far East. So down he goes. He's going eastward at that lower level there. Uh, stop in Cape Town, South Africa, a year into the cruise. Then on the southern Indian Ocean up to Singapore, Indonesia, then back to the southern tip of Africa, up again. Things are wearing down now, and they wind up in a fight off Cherbourg, France. So that's the cruise. It's 22 months, 75,000 miles, 65 prizes, 52 of them burned. It is the most effective, and I emphasize that word, effective, the most effective commerce raider in the entire history of naval warfare. There were other Confederate raiders later in the war that took prizes, some of them a lot of prizes, but because of where and when the SEMS was operating, that is, close to the United States and from September 62 until January 63, those first five months, Sims and his men had far more impacts on the war than any other Confederate raider. Here's the ship. This is a painting by a Liverpool artist, Samuel Walters. It's now at the Williamson Art Gallery in Birkenhead, across the Mersey from Liverpool. It was built by the Laird Brothers Shipyard in Birkenhead and designed by Henry Laird, one of the Laird brothers, and it was a masterpiece for its time. It really was. In profile, it looks rather like one of the great American clipper ships of the 1850s without the smokestack. It's long and narrow by the standards of the time, 220 feet long, 32 feet wide, propelled by both sails and steam, and much faster than any whalers. Uh, it could get up to 15 knots, which was really hauling in those days, with steam power and a favoring wind. Here's the point. No American shipyard in 1862 could have produced so fine a vessel. British shipmen had recognized from the 1830s on that the future of ocean steam was not wooden paddle wheelers. It was iron-hulled screw propeller vehicles for, uh, vessels for various reasons. Though. That was just a much better design. American shipbuilders, especially the ones in Boston and New York, kept turning out these wooden paddle wheelers well into the 1850s. It was ridiculous. But this is a ship that could not have been produced anywhere in the United States. The engine produces 300 horsepower by the measurement of that time. Under sail alone, this is important, the screw could be lifted out of the water and the smokestack taken down so it looks like just a sailing ship. It's a good disguise. But you can see the characteristic clipper design here, the clipper bow, so-called, on the left, 
the undercut champagne stern, as it was called, at the back, and the general configuration of long and lean and lots and lots of billowing sail. The armament that made this a ship of war were first six broadside cannon, and you can see just below the, um, the foremast one of the gun ports there, one of the broadside gun ports. Um, these cannon were not very important, the, the six broadside cannon. The real uh, effect of the ship depended on two pivot guns that were mounted on slides in the middle of the vessel. There's an aft cannon in front of the mizzen mast, that is the hindmost lat, uh, sail there, um, that, sh that threw 68 pound shells, and that wasn't bad, but the real weapon was the Blakely forward pivot gun. It's right behind the foremast. You can't see it here. And it was rifled, which meant it was more accurate, and it threw 100-pound shot, which is a real piece of artillery. The, it was designed by a British Army officer named Blakely and produced by a company in Liverpool. And that was the gun that sank the Hatteras off Galveston. Here's the captain. This is Raphael Semmes. The family called him Rafe. I know that from a letter from one of his relatives during the Civil War. And since the family called him Rafe, I'm figuring the whole name was pronounced Raphael. So I'm going with Raphael. Uh, this, was, this photograph was taken in England in 1862. Now, in a profession where physical size and power and a booming voice were very important in enforcing the captain's authority, Sam's is a little guy. He's under the average height for his time, which means he's maybe five foot five. He never in his life weighed more than 130 pounds, and he spoke in a voice like a woman's, according to the London Times. And this is the captain. So people who met him after his great fame were often surprised, even disappointed. He didn't look or carry himself like a naval hero. He had no swagger. He buckled no swashes. The two, the two notable features here are the eyes, which are determined but a bit opaque, and that loopy mustache, that French mustache. Uh, most men during the war had some sort of facial hair, but hardly anybody had a mustache like that. He waxed it with beeswax, and the men called him old beeswax as a result. And it's his only eccentricity. This is a man who is extremely contained and internal, and then there is that mustache. Well, we're all complicated. This photograph was also taken in London, probably in 1862 also. Semps comes from an old Roman Catholic family, well established in southern Maryland. Ever since the early 1700s, his ancestors had raised tobacco and owned slaves. He is orphaned at the age of 14. Two of his uncles take him in. At 17, in 1826, he joins the U.S. Navy as a midshipman, and he spends 35 years in the Navy, not altogether contented years. He marries a woman from Cincinnati named Ann Spencer. They have five children. She is Protestant and anti-slavery. He is Catholic and pro-slavery, and those religious differences meant a lot more in the early 19th century than they mean now. It was a difficult marriage, and they both had wartime romances. Um, she during the Mexican War while he's off fighting, and he during the Civil War while he's separated, her for, separated from her for about four years. During shore leaves, during his time with the Navy, he reads law and becomes an attorney. He was always a reader and writer, and I think of him that way more than anything. He had a classic writer's personality, to wit, he was solitary, he was silent, he was self-contained and self-sufficient. That's how writers are, that's how I am. If my wife were here, she'd be rolling her eyes at this point. Uh, shipmates were just amazed at how long he could go without talking days at a time sometimes. He just, that was what he was like. And I understand this personality and it goes with being a writer and a reader and a, an intellectual sort of person. After his service in the Mexican War, he writes an excellent history of the war that is still one of the standard sources for the war that was well reviewed around the country. This photograph, my favorite, was taken in Richmond, probably in 1861. You get a particularly good view of the mustache there. Um, and a hint of the bony right shoulder. Look at the right shoulder there. The, the, the thick woolen uniform coat makes him appear bigger than he really was, but you get a hint of a little bony shoulder there on the right. 
As the Civil War had come, he had temporized. He was not a secessionist. He voted for Stephen Douglas in 1864, and as I'm sure you all know, Douglas is the relative centrist in that field. He does a, the Confederate government finally decides for him. It summons him to duty in February of 61, and he does a six-month cruise on a ship called the Sumter, a, Confeder a, a raider doing the same sorts of things, but in a much minor way. That brings him the command of the Alabama. As a commander at sea, responding to shifting conditions and circumstances, all the vagaries of wind and weather, with the next ship on the horizon maybe meaning sudden death if it's a big Union gunboat with bigger guns than he has, he's doing this for 22 months with no let up. And in this capacity, he was absolutely brilliant. And I do not indulge in hyperbole, he was absolutely brilliant imaginative, resourceful, relentless, courageous. He was really good at what he did, and he was just smarter than anybody who was chasing him. Uh, time and again, he outsmarts the Union ships and escapes, pulls some uh, amazing ploy. And he was lucky, at times very lucky. For example, a couple of times they were short of coal or of sea bread, hardtack, and what do they find but their next prize is fully loaded with coal or sea bread. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So it's that blend of skill and fortune, I have to emphasize, that keeps them at sea for almost two years. These are six of the other guys on the Alabama, all of them very important. These are very rare photographs, and you can kind of, they're taken from, a photograph, from an album of photographs that is now in special collections at the University of Alabama Library in Tuscaloosa. And in most cases, they're the only copies of these photographs, so they're really valuable. This is the six, five of these six guys, incidentally, were on the Sumter with uh, Sims in 61 and then came along with him to the Alabama. This man here is the second in command. This is First Lieutenant John McIntosh Kell of Georgia. He was Sims's physical opposite, and I think maybe Sims picked him for that reason, because he's a big, burly guy. He's six foot two, and that was really tall in the 1860s, and strong, and uh, a vivid personality, and a foghorn of a voice, an absolute foghorn of a voice. So when he gave an order, there was no trouble hearing it. He is always up on deck. I don't know when he slept. Uh, he's barking orders. He's usually on the bridge. That's a, a raised vantage point that's just in front of the smokestack and the mainmast there in the middle of the ship. During the entire cruise of almost two years, Kell spends a total of 22 hours off the ship. Otherwise, he's there. When they come into port, everybody else gets shore leave. Sims goes ashore for days at a time sometimes. Kell is there running things. Uh, Sam spent his time down in his cabin, actually, at the stern of the ship. He gave him the course he wanted, and then Kell executed it. He figured how to do it, when to tack, what sails to use, and so on. This is Miles J. Freeman. He's the chief engineer, and he spends his time down in the hot, noisy, smoky bottom of the ship, tending the boilers and the engine. He was a Welshman. He had learned his trade in Scotland, which was then the center of British steamship engineering. When the war began, he was living in New Orleans and working on the Sumter on its peacetime mission of running down to Havana and back. So he naturally joins the Confederate Navy and is the chief engineer on the Sumter and then comes over to the Alabama. This is a very important crossroads for ocean uh, navigation because it's the transition from sail to steam and, and Freeman represents this. The two worlds, sail and steam above and below deck are very separate. They have little interaction, they have distinct expertises, and they're kind of suspicious of each other actually. Up on deck, everybody had grown up on sailing ships from Sims on down. That is what they knew. They had all learned their trade before steam was much used at sea. Down below, the engineers and the coal stokers represented the 19th century industrial revolution at sea. They're not sailors at all. They're, they're more like factory workers. So they're very distinct cultures. They're very distinct bodies of knowledge. The Alabama very seldom used its steam power because it, Sam's preferred to save the coal for a possible emergency when he might have to run. But Freeman was also in charge of the 
steam condenser, the water condenser that provided fresh water. And that is what let the ship stay at sea for months at a time, that they generated their own fresh water. Semmes knew his importance and let, left Freeman alone to his arcane pursuits, none of which Semmes himself understood or wanted to understand. This is George Fulham, F-U-L-L-A-M. He's the master's mate, also a Brit. He's from Hull, England. He kept a shipboard journal that was later published and is invaluable for its perspective, you see, just below the top officers. The top officers see certain things and the master's mate sees other things and has a particularly different angle on things than the top guys. He was also very useful, George Fulham, because when they were approaching an enemy ship under a British flag, which was typically how they operated, his voice, amplified by a speaking trumpet, completed the disguise because of his English accent. The ship looked and sounded like an English ship, so nothing to worry about, and then they strike the colors and put up the stars and bars, and all of a sudden the Union ship realizes what's going on here. This is Breedlove Smith the captain's clerk, as he was called. He was basically the captain's assistant, uh, took charge of his correspondence, maintained the ship's library of captured books and newspapers. And he's the only college man on board, so far as I have been able to learn. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia and a cultured, sophisticated man. On those rare occasions when Semmes felt like conversing, Smith could talk on the captain's level because they were both educated cultured people. Day to day, Smith saw more of him than anybody else. His cabin was right next to Semmes' at the stern of the lower deck. Um, so he's very important to the crews and is utterly devoted to Semmes. This handsome dog is Lieutenant Beckett K. Howell of Mississippi. He's the only Marine on board, and he trains the gun crews and others in the manual of arms and close order drill. He's also a brother-in-law of Jefferson Davis, and perhaps for that reason, he is Semmes' apparent favorite among the officers. And then finally, Arthur Sinclair, Arthur T. Sinclair of Virginia. He's the son and grandson of U.S. Naval officers. He had served, in fact, on the CSS Virginia, the Merrimack, in its battle with the Union Ironclad Monitor in March of 1862, and then he is transferred to the Alabama later that year. Three decades after the war, he writes a superb book, Two Years on the Alabama, published in 1895. It's balanced, it's perceptive, well-written, fair to all parties. If you were gonna read just one book on Sims in the Alabama, and you didn't wanna read my book, that would be a mistake. <laughs> but if you wanted to do that, this is the book to read. Arthur T. Sinclair, Two, year, two Years on the Alabama, it's available online now at the Hathi Trust and other places. My book differs from others. There's been a, a fair number of books on this subject, but my book differs from the others in my description of general conditions aboard the cruiser. Most of the historical literature on the cruise has been essentially drawn from the internal sources. That is, especially Semmes' journal, which he wrote in faithfully every day for 22 months it fills 132 densely printed pages of the official records of the navies. Uh, it's a very full record. It is by far the most important single source on the Alabama's cruise. Also George Fulham's journal, which I've mentioned, and post-war memoirs by Semmes and Kell and Arthur Sinclair. These five sources, the two journals and the three memoirs, are all very well known, readily available. They've all been republished in recent decades. Uh, they're obvious, inevitable sources. But the external sources, that is, the impressions of outsiders, usually Union captives who were brought aboard, have been relatively neglected, in part because they're buried in old newspapers and manuscript collections and obscure government documents. They're simply harder to find than the usual traditional internal sources. So these two clusters of sources are biased in opposite directions, of course. The internal sources over here describe a disciplined naval ship, orderly, obedient, with well-behaved boarding parties, and officers that treated captives kindly. The external sources over here describe a pirate ship, sloppy, ill-disciplined, dirty, 
with mutinous sailors and boarding parties that routinely got drunk and stole whatever they wished and treated prisoners in ways that varied enormously. So we got these two clusters of sources and the truth is probably in here somewhere. It's somewhere between the two of them. But the external sources deserve more attention than they've generally had and that is one of the ways my book differs from the previous accounts. Now the impacts of the cruise is an enormous subject that I have to gallop through quickly here. Um, the immediate effect is shock and panic. There's no other way to describe it in northern port cities in the fall of 62 and the spring of 63. They're afraid to go out to sea because this guy Sam's may be lurking anywhere. They never know where he is. Uh, the speed and extent of this response is made possible because this is the first war that is fought under the triple technological revolution of railroads, telegraph, and high-speed high speed, uh, newspaper printing presses. So it's the, the most covered war there has ever been. The coverage is quicker and fuller and less inhibited. Something could happen in the South, a battle, and New Yorkers could read about it the next morning at breakfast. That had never happened before in any war. So the effects of SEMS are magnified because of this triple revolution. The news of what he's doing can spread more quickly, can spread everywhere, and it really freaks people out in the North, especially in those first five months. And they also provide SEMS with all the intelligence he needs, because when he captures a ship, they usually have a pile of newspapers, or recent newspapers that they've gotten wherever they came from. So he takes these newspapers, and good old Breedlove Smith, his clerk, goes through them, and it tells him everything he needs to know about ship schedules, and what ship is going where, at what time, and what ships are pursuing him. It's a great source of intelligence, because Lincoln tried to rein in the newspapers, especially Stanton as Attorney General, and they couldn't do it. It was impossible. The newspapers did whatever they wanted. So here's an example of Semmes' coverage. This is from Leslie's Illustrated, one of the two big weeklies of the time, looking suitably piratical, I must say. I mean, he looks a little dangerous there, doesn't he? And it, it's actually a pretty good rendition of him. Um, he keeps showing up somewhere he wasn't supposed to be, and he does something remarkable, and then he disappears, and no one knows where he is. Uh, we're still decades away from wireless at sea. There is no way to communicate among vessels at sea or from ship to shore. It, it, this isn't possible till the early 20th century. So people are freaking out. Northern Mar Marine Insurance Companies, which usually charge about 8% of the value of the ship and the cargo, they keep raising the added wartime risks rates from 2% ultimately to 10%. So the usual insurance rate is more than doubled, and at that rate, it's ruinous. It's impossible. So a lot of people just don't pay any insurance at all. They just risk being caught by SEMS or the other cruisers. So in response, the Union ship owners sell their ships to foreign interests, especially our enemies, the Brits. By the end of the war, over 900, 900 Union ships had been sold into foreign hands, mainly British to avoid the Alabama and the other Confederate cruisers. So the U U.S. merchant fleet was dealt blows from which it has never recovered. It has never regained its eminence of the 1850s when U.S. merchant ships really dominated the seas. We have never gotten back to that, and it's because preeminently of Sims and the Alabama. The Alabama's impact on the military aspects of the war was mainly in causing the diversion of limited, precious naval resources. There were great political pressures from the aggrieved merchants of Boston, Philadelphia, New York. So the Navy, the US Navy, had to switch ships from the rather porous naval blockade of the South to chasing Sims. Six ships, and then a dozen, and then 18 ships were out chasing them by early 1863, all trying to catch one elusive cruiser. In particular, the Vanderbilt, which was a converted ocean liner, the biggest, fastest ship in the U.S. Navy, over three times the size of Semmes' ship, with twice its gunpowder, a gunpower, was sent out on the sole mission in 1863 to catch and sink the Alabama. Never came close, because the Vanderbilt was actually a big, obsolete turkey. It was a wooden paddle wheeler in the 1860s that consumed 100 tons of coal a day, 
Uh, the Alabama used 20 tons when it was using its steam power, which was infrequent. The Vanderbilt was very expensive to run and to maintain, prone to breakdowns, needed hundreds of crewmen above and below deck. All of this devoted at an exorbitant cost to one hapless and hopeless pursuit. Now this is a great age of occasional poetry. That is verse written for an occasion. A public event, a public event would typically include speakers and a band to play some music and a poem written for that event. For example, this is George H. Bacher of Philadelphia. He's a popular poet of the time, since forgotten. He gave me the title of my book, Wolf of the Deep. This is poetry for the ear, folks. It's best appreciated when heard. So here we are at an event, an event in 1863, and they're worried about the Alabama, and up steps George H. Bacher and reads, Gaily along the rebel came, under the flag of the cross of shame, Knight of the handcuff and bloody lash, he twirled the point of his red mustache and swore in English, not over nice, to sink our Yankee scum in a trice. Semmes has been a wolf of the deep for many a day to harmless sheep. Ships he scuttled and robbed and burned, watches pilfered and pockets turned. Rhyme and rhythm, rhyme and rhythm, it's the pulse of life, and it's just a shame that poets don't write this stuff anymore. I love it. This is a magazine illustration by the great American artist uh, Winslow Homer. This is he in 1863. He was 27 years old. He looks rather rakish there and has a rather Semsian mustache, actually, doesn't he? He spent the war as a staff artist for Harper's Weekly. Harper's and Leslie's were the two big illustrated weeklies at that time. This drawing on him appear, by him appeared in the magazine in the spring of 1863, and it's titled The Approach of the British Pirate Alabama. There off at sea, you can see in the upper left corner, a steamship with three masts. The Alabama was a steamship with three masts. And in the middle there is an officer, and there are two sailors there, barely visible off to the right. They're all peering out there, and they figure, yeah, it's probably the, the Alabama, and if it's the Alabama, we are toast. And then just to emphasize the point, grouped around the officer are four women in various postures of feminine vulnerability and defenselessness. Uh, on the right you see a, a beautiful young mother holding a baby. Next to her in a rather ungainly posture is a rather larger woman, but there's a hint of ankle and calf. And let me tell you, in 1863 if you saw an ankle and a calf, that was hot stuff. Then to the left of the officer, another woman beseeching him, worried, what is that, what is that, is that the Alabama? And a child to her left as we look at it, and then a, a young woman, an adolescent woman, pointing out to sea, just in case no one's noticing it. And they know, I mean, if that's the Alabama, she's faster than they are, she's got lots of guns, they don't have any guns, and they weren't maybe aware that no one died when the Alabama caught you. I, they were gonna lose their property, they knew that the ship was going to burn, but no one was going to be harmed. They would be landed safely, but still, they didn't want to be caught. It catches something in the, in the mood of, of the North in the spring of 63. Meantime, across the sea, and this is the third major area of impact, there's a steady crisis in Anglo-American relations because the Alabama was illegally built in a British shipyard. They weren't supposed to build a ship in England for the Civil War. It was against the law. It was entirely equipped and gunned from British sources, and it was crewed almost entirely by British sailors. Now, early in the war, before the Emancipation Proclamation, most articulate Brits, that is, the Church of England, the aristocracy, most professionals and intellectuals, Charles Dickens, the noted friend of the underdog, and the press, especially the London Times, all of these people supported the South, seeing it as a plucky little chap standing up to a bigger bully, you see. And there was also a certain amount of schadenfreude over the problems of this headlong democracy of the United States. So here is part of the front page of the Illustrated London News in December of 1862. Semmes is paired with Stonewall Jackson as the Confederate heroes of the moment. That's the pre-war, pre-beard Stonewall, and I gotta say he looks a lot better without the beard. Uh, it's a big deal, and they're very much rooting for Sims in the Alabama, and I think they're kind of proud that it's a British ship that is doing all this unstoppable damage. 
Given all this British assistance to the Confederates, there were many people in the North who were enraged at this British meddling in American affairs, and it almost caused the third Anglo-American war in less than a century. They came this close. The US minister in England, Charles Francis Adams, looking as usual like he'd be just a whole lot of fun, <laughs> he sends many paper volleys to the British Foreign Secretary, Lord John Russell, demanding financial compensation because here is this British product with mainly British men destroying all this Union commerce in significant ways, and he demands financial compensation for the Union losses. Adams didn't expect any quick satisfaction, and in fact he got none, none whatever, but he is building a legal record that after the war helps settle the Alabama claims, as they are called, which is the first international tribunal and eventually assesses $15.5 million of damages that Britain has to pay to the United States because of these losses caused by British-built ships. These two bulldogs spent the war growling at each other, and it never went beyond growling, but it came really close at a couple of times. It almost happened. And if that had happened, the war, the Civil War is over. We could not possibly have fought the South and the most powerful nation in the world at the same time. Semmes and his ship reached the climax of the cruise after a year, August 1863, when they stop at Cape Town, South Africa. They get a delirious reception from the English colonists who sympathize with the South and are just amazed that such a famous ship suddenly showed up there. No one ever knows where the Alabama is going to show up, and it mysteriously appears there at the bottom of the world. And they have, the, the Alabama's men have a great time. The this is the most raucous, the most celebrating time of the entire cruise. A Cape Town photographer comes on board and takes this shot. It's one of only two surviving photographs of Semmes on his ship. There is no sharp, clear print of this photograph, unfortunately. It's been duplicated so many times by the old ways that was done that it has lost definition. But you get the general idea. That is Semmes in the middle there, leaning on the stern pivot gun, uh, holding binoculars in his right hand, and looking, I must say, rather pleased with himself, as well he might. This was the high point of the whole cruise. He's being celebrated all over the world, really, and behind him, as always, is Lieutenant Kell backing him up. That is the ship's wheel, right behind Kell, right behind his left arm, you see? That's how they steer the thing. Behind that is the mizzenmast, the, the rearmost of the three masts. As I say, Semmes is leaning on the rear pivot gun, which can be moved and turned, unlike the broadside cannon, which can't be turned at all. Over Semmes' right shoulder, you see a sailor with a telescope, and there's another guy left to him. All you can see of the other guy is his arm and a bit of the telescope. But even here, when they're at anchor in Cape Town and having a great time and everybody loves them, they can never relax. For 22 months, they can never relax. So these guys are looking out to sea and hoping not to see a Union gunboat, gunboat bearing down on them. It's just extraordinary, the pressure of it, especially on Sims. Every single day, every minute he was awake, there is this pressure. What's going to happen next? What are we going to find next? So um, after that, there's 10 months left in the cruise, but it's running down. It's poor hunting. Uh, there's so many Yankee ships were hiding in ports or avoiding the usual shipping lanes or, as I have said, sold off to the Brits. Semmes had done his job too well, as a matter of fact. The quarry had largely disappeared by then. The ship was worn. It had never been overhauled in all that time. It's running down. The boilers are leaky. The hull below the waterline is coated with marine plants and organisms slowing it. Its top speed now is only eight knots and change, about half of its original top speed. Sam's is 54 years old, and that is pretty old for what he's doing. Usually it was younger men who went to sea for this long a time, and he feels it. He feels too old for his job. He writes in his journal. Uh, it's extraordinarily personal at times. Mostly it's just the record of what's going on, but occasionally he steps back and says how he's feeling, and how he's feeling is he's depressed. He says, I'm so sick of the noise of the wind roaring through the rigging and the bad weather and the choppy seas. He was prone to seasickness. 
Yeah. And his cabin is at the stern of the ship, the very worst place because the rocking motions are exaggerated there, you know? It's the end of a long lever. And for some reason, the captain's cabin had always been at the stern. It would have been much better if he'd moved to the middle of the ship. He had that authority, but he's there in his cabin throwing up all the time. He was never robust to begin with, and he's lost weight. So one external source calls him a mere skeleton of a man. He's tired of the cruise. He wants to go home. The crew is nearly mutinous by this time. As I say, they were mainly British. They did not care about the war. They had signed on for money and adventure. Now, back in the Azores in August 62, Sims's recruiting pitch had promised them exciting gun battles. They loved that. Rollicking liberty on shore in a well-supplied port city. And prize money from captures that they would take into port and sell and then distribute the money. Sims had promised them all these things. But in fact, the sailors had gotten just the one battle with the Hatteras. Not much liberty except at deserted places that had no bars or brothels and nothing to interest a sailor. And no prize money at all because he couldn't sell his prizes. All he could do was burn them or put them on bond, which went, if the South won, then they would pay him some money. Everybody is exhausted. The ship, the men, they're just, they've run down. So they limp into the French port of Cherbourg in June of 1864. The French emperor, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, a nephew of the Napoleon, had been friendly at times to the Southern cause. The U.S. vice consul in Cherbourg telegraphed the news to the uh, U.S. minister in Paris, who telegraphed the news to a ship, the Kearsarge, a Union ship that was patrolling off um, the Netherlands. So again, you see the effect of the telegram. Bing, bing, bing. They know right away the Alabama is in Cherbourg. So the Kearsarge starts charging across the channel, takes two days to arrive there, drops anchor, and blocks the Alabama. Sims has no choice. He has to sit, agree to come out and fight. Uh, he, if he just stays in the harbor, there will be a whole flotilla of Union gunboats outside, all of them gunning for the glory of sinking the Alabama. So Sims agrees. Uh, he'll come out and fight after he's done some repairs and coaled up, uh, um, replenished his coal supply. Thomas Buchanan Reed was a poet and a portrait painter from Philadelphia, here resembling the spirit of Edgar Allan Poe, don't you think? The reference to the despot here is to Louis Napoleon, who was an autocrat with delusions of glory. The title is The Eagle and Vulture. In Cherbourg Roads, the pirate lay one morn in June like a beast at bay, feeling secure in the neutral port under the guns of the Frenchman's fort. A thieving vulture, a coward thing, sheltered beneath a despot's wing. Cue the violins. But there outside in the calm blue bay, our ocean eagle, the Kearsarge, lay, lay at her ease on the Sunday morn, holding the Corsair ship in scorn. The battle, June 19th, Sunday, 1864, was brief and unequal. The two ships were about the same size, but the Yankee had two big Dahlgren cannon that threw shot, solid shot, of 160 pounds, which was much heavier and more penetrating than anything the Alabama had. And after two years at sea, the, the Alabama's fuses and gunpowder were degraded by ocean moisture and by the steam condenser, which was unhappily located right next to the powder magazine on the lower deck. And gunnery drills on the Alabama had been neglected because during the second year, the, the crew was so close to mutiny. It seemed too risky to let them routinely handle guns. So it was over after a bit more than an hour. These next two illustrations are from the Illustrated London News, and they appeared just after the battle based on eyewitnesses, and they're quite accurate, actually. What we see here is the two ships locked in battle. They're, they're circling each other, starboard to starboard. That is the Alabama on the right. You can see the stars and bars there on the mizzenmast, and the Kearsarge enveloped in smoke and steam there. So they're circling around a distance of several hundred yards, firing away. The kill shot from a Dahlgren cannon breaks into the Alabama at the waterline. 
Making a hole big enough to swallow a wheelbarrow, it enters the engine room and explodes. And that's it, folks. The rising water snuffs out the boilers so the ship is powerless and helpless. And down it goes, in theory. Uh, well, trust me. There it is, there it is, okay. What we see is the Alabama on the left foundering. The stern goes down, the ship goes up to a vertical position, lingers there for an instant, and then down she goes. Over on the right, you see the Deerhound. Uh, this is an English yacht that had just happened on the scene the night before, had heard about the impending fight and decided to stick around. I think there was some sort of prearrangement between the Deerhound and the guys on the Alabama because the Deerhound rushes up, picks up Sims and Kell, the two top officers, a lot of the other officers, some of the sailors and firemen, coal stokers, and runs off. Instead of surrendering them to the Kearsarge, which is what it was supposed to do, what it was expected to do, they turn and run to Southampton, which is 70 miles across the channel, rescuing Sims and Kell and most of his top officers. That was a matter of some grievance to the Union people, as you can imagine. I have three paintings of the crews. This is by Edwin Hayes, an English painter, done in 1864. It's now at the Chicago Historical Society, and it, it's a desperate scene there. You can see you can see the men in the water in the foreground there, struggling to get onto a lifeboat. You can see two guys dropping off the bow of the Alabama. You see there in midair, some other guys clinging to the bowsprit other men at various places on the ship. There's the Kearsarge in the middle and the Deerhound coming up to pluck them. A detail identifies that this is uh, an artist right, uh, painting from a southern viewpoint. The southern version was that the Kearsarge was slow to lower its lifeboats. And you see the lifeboats are still up on the Kearsarge there, even as the Alabama is going blub blub. Now this ship, this painting rather, is from a Union view viewpoint. This is by the American painter Xanthus Russell Smith. This was done in 1875. It's now at the Union League Club of Philadelphia. You can see that's the, um, the Kearsarge off to the right, and you can see that its lifeboats have been deployed. They're in the water. So, And finally this. This is the one painting by a truly great painter. This is by the French Impressionist Edward Manet. It's now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. He was not a witness, as is sometimes claimed. Manet came to Cherbourg a few days later, talked to eyewitnesses, and then did this painting. What I like about it is you get a sense of the mystery of a battle. Men who have been in battle often say that you can't tell what's going on, that uh, things are invisible. A lot of things are happening at once. There's blood, there's body parts. And you get that sense here. That's the Alabama foundering. And in the distance, you can't see it, is the Kearsarge. It's concealed by smoke from the steam engines, from the cannon. Off to the right is the uh, Deerhound about to come up. The Kearsarge suffers minor damage and three wounded men, one of whom later died. The Alabama counted 26 dead, 21 wounded, 47 casualties, almost a third of the ship's company. Sims is rescued by the Deerhound. He recuperates for three months in London and on the continent with his English girlfriend, a woman named Louise, Louisa Tremlett, and her brother Francis, an Anglican minister, then goes home to his wife and family in Alabama. After 1865, he writes his second war memoir, 833 pages of stubborn undefeat, and settles into a peaceful life as an attorney in Mobile, dies in August of 1877, almost 68 years old. 120 years after the battle, in 1984, the wreck of the Alabama is found uh, by a French minesweeper which was actually looking for it just as a training exercise. It's in 200 feet of cold, murky water, brisk tidal currents. 30 years ago, only about a third of the hull was left, and le less is there now. Many artifacts have been recovered, the stern pivot cannon, but eventually the channel tides will sweep all of the hull away, and there will just be the boilers and thousands of metal and glass fragments. Thank you for your attention, folks. Thank you. Uh -uh. No time for questions. Thank you.